Darwin's Doubt, Part 5. We have been going over the book Darwin's Doubt by Stephen C. Meyer. He's the author of Signature in the Cell, uh, was previously an oil industry geophysicist before, before he became interested in life in general and the Cambrian explosion in particular. He got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. He's a director of the, the Center for Science and Culture of the Discovery Institute. And the book really is um, a massive expansion, which we're going to get a little bit of inside information on, of Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information in the Higher Taxonomic Categories in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. The uh, book cover as I find very attractive anyway. Uh, in the prologue, he says exactly what he's going to do. The book is divided into three main parts. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? And uh, we are into part two at this time. The story so far in part one, we have had the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. By the way, the green stuff is my own comments. Um, and uh, the white stuff is all, uh, or the, the plain background is, the, uh, is uh, Darwin's uh, doubt itself. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Changjiang fossils. The excuse that Precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preser preserved, has been refuted by the evidence. Claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. In other words, it's not really true. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. The tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion because it has multiple faults. Uh, there isn't really a totally coherent con tree of life, and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the, the Cambrian explosion. And that's where we left off the story of part one. Part two is how to build an animal. And I guess we're just into part two, the Cambrian information explosion. For many biologists, the iconic image of Darwin's tree of life represents perhaps the single best distillation of what the science of evolutionary biology has to teach namely, the fact of evolution, apart from which nothing in biology makes sense. Though the fossil record does not directly attest to many of the expected intermediate forms represented on Darwin's tree, leading authorities assert that other lines of evidence, particularly from genetics, firmly establish Darwin's tree as a correct picture of the history of life, and we discussed that in Chapter 6. When I, as Stephen Meyer, was a college professor, I used to ask my students a question. If you want your computer to acquire a new function or capability, what do you have to give it? Typically, I would hear a smattering of similar answers from the class. Code, instructions, software, information. Of course, all of these are correct. And thanks to discoveries in modern biology, we now know that something similar is true of life. To build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form requires new information. To this point, I've examined one main aspect of the mystery surrounding the Cambrian explosion, the mystery of the pre missing pre-Cambrian ancestral forms expected on the basis of Darwin's theory. The next group of chapters will examine a second and perhaps more profound aspect of the Cambrian mystery, that of the cause of the Cambrian explosion. By what means or process or mechanism could something as complex as a trilobite have arisen? Could natural selection have accomplished such a feat? We'll see. Again, this is the Reader's Digest version, so I will skip paragraphs on occasion and, and uh, omit things and try to indicate that whenever I do. We'll see that an important part of the answer to that question will have something to do with the concept of information. As Darwin envisioned the process, natural selection can accomplish nothing without a steady supply of variation as a source of new biological traits, forms, and structures. Only after useful new variations arise can natural selection sift them from the chaff of unhelpful variations. If, however, the amount of variation available to natural selection is limited, then natural selection will encounter limits on how much new biological form and structure it can build. Are there limits or are there not? 
Even in the late 19th century, many leading scientists recognized this. For this reason, there's been a long history of scientific controversy about just how much novelty natural selection can produce and about whether natural selection is a truly creative process. In fact, between 1870 and 1920, classical Darwinism entered a period of eclipse because many scientists thought that it could not explain the origin and transmission of new heritable variation. Yeah, you think that's wrong? He has a reference for it. This book is referenced very, in a very detailed way. If correct, blending inheritance, which is what Darwin believed, would eventually lead to a bland, homogeneous, uh, variationless state in a population. Uh, some people would call that homogeneous. The classical Mendelian genetics that replaced Darwin's blending theory of inheritance also suggested limitations on the amount of genetic variability available to natural selection. If plants re re plant reproduction produced either green or yellow peas, but never some intermediate form, and if the signals for producing the green trait and the yellow traits persisted unchanged from generation to generation, it was difficult to see how sexual reproduction and genetic recombination could produce anything more than unique combinations of already existing traits. So it didn't matter whether you had Darwin's or Mendel's ideas, you still, where do you get the new stuff? But then Darwinism mutates. During the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, however, developments in genetics revived natural selection as the main en engine of evolutionary change. Experiments performed by Hermann Mueller in 1927 showed that X-rays could alter the genetic composition of fruit flies, resulting in unusual variations. Mueller called these X-rays, X-ray-induced changes, mutations. The discovery of genetic mutations also suggested a way to reconcile Darwinian theory with insights from Mendelian genetics. During the 1930s and 1940s, a group of evolutionary biologists, including Sewell Wright, Ernst Meyer, Theodosius Dobzhansky, J.B.S. Haldane, and George Gaylord Simpson, attempted to demonstrate this possibility using mathematical models to show that small-scale variations in mutations could accumulate over time in whole populations eventually producing large-scale morphologic change. And this is what formed the basis for population genetics. The overall synthesis of Mendelian genetics with Darwinian theory came to be called neo-Darwinism, or simply the new synthesis. According to this new synthetics theory, the mechanism of natural selection acting upon genetic mutations suffices to account for the origin of novel biological forms. Small-scale microevolutionary changes can accumulate to produce large-scale macroevolutionary innovations, and which is why evolutionists often argue that there really is no difference between the two. So if you accept mutations in bacteria, then you've got to accept molecules to man. By 1959, it was widely assumed that natural selection and random mutations could indeed build new forms of life over the course of time. Uh, variation is information. Initially, the elucidation of the structure of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick contributed to this uh, euphoria. Indeed, it seemed to lift the mechanism of genetic variation and mutation out of the mist and into the clear light of the emerging science of molecular biology. This elucidation suggested that DNA stored genetic information in the form of a four-character digital and chemical code. And indeed, most people would ag agree with that. In this famous picture of Watson and Crick uh, presenting their DNA model. Later, following the formation, uh, formulation of Francis Crick's famed sequence hypothesis, molecular biologists confirmed that the chemical subunits along the spine of the DNA molecule called nu nucleotide bases function just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a machine code. Biologists established that the precise arrangement of these nucleotide bases conveyed instructions for building proteins. Most of this should be pretty familiar with you in a, a schematic of DNA with a spiral and then kind of opened up to show you the, the code itself. The eluc elucidation of the double helix seemed to resolve some long-standing issues in evolutionary biology. Darwinis, Darwinists had long maintained that natural selection produced new forms by separating the proverbial wheat from the chaff of genetic variation. 
but they didn't know where the raw material for all the competing variations resided. Watson and Crick's model suggested an answer to that question. Genes correspond to long sequences of bases on a strand of DNA. New variations arose first from the genetic recombination of different sections of DNA, different genes, during sexual reproduction, and second from a special kind of variation called mutations that occurred from random changes in the arrangement of nucleotide bases in DNA. Just as a few typos in an English sentence might alter the meaning of a few words, or maybe even the whole sentence, so might a change in subsequent arrangement of the bases in the genetic text in DNA produce new proteins or morphological traits. Watson and Crick's discovery also raised new questions, in particular questions about the information necessary to build completely new forms of life during the course of biological uh, evolution. True, mutations play a role in this process, but could they generate enough information to produce novel forms of animal life, such as those that arose in the Cambrian period? An explosion, a vast proliferation of new biological information. And that's the question he's going to probe for probably the rest of this whole section. And so he's going to talk about the Cambrian information explosion first, which is you know, all the body parts. Well, you have to have instructions as to how to get those strange bodies. Consider choanoflagellates, a group of singular, single-celled eukary eukaryotic organisms with a flagellum. What separates such organisms, single-celled, from a trilobite or a mollusk or even a lowly sponge? Clearly, all three of these higher forms of life are more complex than any one-celled organism, but how much more complex? Functionally, more complex animals require more cell types to uh, perform their diverse functions. Arthropods and mollusks, for example, have dozens of specified tissues and organs, each of which requires functionally dedicated or specialized cell types. These new cell types, in turn, require many new and specialized proteins. An epithelial lining, a cell lining a gut or intestine, for example, secretes a specific digestive enzyme. Actually, it secretes many specific digestive enzymes. The enzyme requires, each one of them, requires structural proteins to modify its shape and regulatory enzymes to control the sequence, secretion of the digestive enzyme itself. So it doesn't just keep putting it out when it doesn't need it. So you've got to tell the cell how to make this thing and when to make it and all that stuff. And that requires instructions, genetic information. Applying this insight to ancient life forms underscores just how dramatically, the, just how dramatic the Cambrian explosion was. For over three billion years, the living world included little more than one-celled organisms such as bacteria and algae. Then, beginning in the late Ediacaran period, the first complex multicellular organisms appeared in the rock strata, including sponges and whatever those Ediacaran uh, biota were. This represents a large increase in complexity. The sponges that appeared in the late Precambrian, for example, probably required about 10 cell types. Then 40 million years later, by the conventional chronology, the Cambrian explosion occurred. Suddenly the ocean swarmed with animals such as trilobites and amylocarids that probably required 50 or more cell types, an even greater jump in complexity. And keep in mind that each one of these would have 50 cell types that might not all be identical with the 50 cell types of something else. So now for each phylum, you might have 50 cells, let's say, with half overlap. And now you're talking uh, for two phyla, 75, for three phyla, 100, for some 30 phyla, which is uh, Stephen Jay Gould's best estimate, something like uh, about 25 times 30, whatever that is. So you have, suddenly you have all kinds of cell types coming out. More of his Valentine notes, measuring complexity differences by measuring differences in the number of cell types probably, as he puts it, greatly underestimates the complexity differentials between body plans. One way to estimate the amount of new genetic information that appeared within, with the Cambrian animals is to measure the size of the genomes. <coughs> 
of modern representatives of the Cambrian groups and compare them to the amount of information in simpler forms of life. Molecular biologists have estimated that a minimally complex single-celled organism would require something between 318,000 and 562,000 base pairs of DNA to produce the proteins necessary to maintain life. Now that's minimally complex and uh, that may be an underestimate, but okay, more complex simple uh, single cells might require upwards of a million base pairs of DNA. Yet to assemble the proteins necessary to sustain a complex arthropod such as a trilobite would need orders of magnitude more protein coding instructions. <coughs> Just to compare Drosophila melanogaster, 140 million base pairs. Now, how many of those could you get rid of and still have a fly? We don't know. Maybe it's half, but it, even if it was half, you'd still be looking at um, 70 million base pairs compared with our 1 million or 300,000 base pairs for the more simple organism. So transitions from a single cell to colonies of cells in the complex animals represent significant and in principle measurable increases in genetic information. During the Cambrian period, a veritable carnival of novel biological forms arose. But because new biological form requires new cell types, proteins, and genetic information, the Cambrian explosion of animal life is also it also generated a, an explosion of genetic information unparalleled in the previous history of life. Uh, in chapter 14, we'll see that building a new animal body plan also requires another type of information not stored in genes called epigenetic information. Biological information, Shannon or otherwise. Now he's going to discuss Shannon information, which is a... Um, some people think of it as the only information, and as we see, it, it will turn out to be defective. Scientists typically recognize at least two basic types of information, functional or meaningful information, and so-called Shannon information. Information theory, during the 1940s, Claude Shannon developed a mathematical theory of information. Shannon equated the amount of information transmitted by a sequence of symbols or characters with the amount of uncertainty reduced or eliminated by the transmission of that sequence. Shannon's theory quantified the intuitive connection between reduced uncertainty and information by asserting that the more uncertainty of an event or a communication eliminated, the more information it conveyed. Um, and then he has a long section that, that discusses this kind of in lay terms, and the pitcher will throw the ball. Well, duh, pitchers always throw the ball, right? Okay, if you know, they're gonna, if you know they've got a team, knowing that really doesn't reduce any uncertainty. However, if you have four pitchers and pitcher A will start, that reduces your uncertainty by a factor of four. If you've got two quarterbacks and you say quarterback B will start, it reduces your uncertainty by a factor of two. And so what they usually do is they log the number of bits that it would take you to say that. And so knowing that quarterback A will start uh, takes two bits to say, knowing that quarterback B will start. In other words, you could give quarterback 1, 0, quarterback 1, 1, quarterback 0, 0, quarterback 0, 1. You put one of those four, and you can give two bits of information and specify which quarterback it is, whereas, uh, pardon me, which pitcher it is, whereas if you're doing quarterbacks, you have either 0 or 1, that's all you need. The more improbable event eliminated more possibilities and more uncertainty, thus it contained more information. Each base in a DNA sequence conveys two bits of information since one in four is equal to one chance in two times two. Yet the applicability of Shannon information theory to molecular biology has to some degree obscured a key distinction concerning the type of information the DNA possesses. Although Shannon's theory measures the amount of information in a sequence of symbols or characters or chemicals uh, functioning as such, and there, by the way, there's another Kolmogorov information which gives you the same kind of, um, close to the same thing as, as Shannon information um, with a slightly different twist. Um, 
It doesn't distinguish between a meaningful or functional sequence from useless gibberish. For example, if you say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that tells you something. And most of you will recognize that as a quote from the Declaration of Independence. The second line, which I won't try to pronounce, unless you have some kind of a code that can turn that into meaningful information, it's total nonsense. Um, and for example, if I were to change this H into a J, it wouldn't matter. Because it doesn't tell you what the first line does. And that's the difference between meaningful information and Shannon information. Both of those sentences have the same amount of Shannon information. But obviously, one of them has a great deal more meaningful information. These two sequences are equally long, equally improbable if we imagine them to be drawn at random. So they contain the same amount of Shannon information. Yet clearly, there's an important qualitative distinction between them that the Shannon information measurement just does not capture. The first meaning full sentence performs a communication function, while the second does not. In a sense, it, that is Shannon information, provides a measure of a sequence capacity to carry functional or meaningful information. It does not and cannot determine whether the sequence in question does convey meaningful information or generate a functionally significant effect. Strands of DNA containing information carrying capacity, something Shannon's theory can measure. But DNA, like natural languages and computer codes, also contains functional information. As in computer codes, the precise arrangement of characters or chemicals functioning as characters allows the sequence to produce a, specify, a specific effect. For this reason, I also like to use the term specified information as a synonym, synonym for functional information because the function of a sequence of characters depends on the specific arrangement of those characters. The message is a mystery. So, if the origin of Cambrian animals required vast amounts of new functional or specified information, what produced this information explosion? Since the molecular biological revolution first highlighted the primacy of information to the maintenance and function of living systems, questions about the origin of information have moved decidedly to the forefront of discussions about evolutionary theory. What's more, the realization is a specificity of arrangement rather than the mere improbability. Characterizes the genetic text, has raised some, raised some challenging questions about the adequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Is it plausible to think that natural selection working on random mutations in DNA could produce that highly specific arrangements of bases necessary to generate the protein building blocks of new cell types and novel forms of life. Perhaps nowhere do such questions pose more of a challenge to neo-Darwinian theory than in discussions of the Cambrian explosion. Marie Eden, a professor of engineering and computer sciences at MIT, was accustomed to thinking about how to build things. But when he began to consider the importance of information of building the living organisms, he realized something didn't add up. His critics said that he knew just enough biology to be dangerous. In retrospect, they were probably right. Eden began to think about the challenge of building a living organism. He wondered whether mutation and selection could generate the needed functional information. To his way of thinking, specificity was a big part of the problem. Obviously, if DNA contained an improbable sequence of nucle nucleotide bases in which the arrangement of bases does not matter to the function of the molecule, any old string will do then random mutational changes in the sequence of bases would not have a detrimental effect on the function of the molecule. But, of course, sequence does affect function. Eden knew that in all computer codes or written text in which the specificity of se sequence determines function, random changes in sequence consistently degrade function or meaning. That is to say, deleterious mutations are far more common than... Uh, uh, than uh, uh, advantageous ones. No currently existing formal language can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. 
And uh, he got together the Wistari uh, Conference in the 1960s, he began discussing the plausibility of the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution with several MIT colleagues in math, physics, and computer science, and they all came to the same general conclusion. Um, the, uh, as this discussion widened, they got a conference ready, and in 1966, a distinguished group of mathematicians, engineers, and scientists convened at a conference at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia called Mathematical Challenge to his challenges to the Neo-Darwinian interpretation of evolution. This goes all the way back to 1966. Prominent among the attendees were Marcel Paul Schützenberger, a mathematician and physician at the University of Paris. By the way, you might be interested that one of his students um, is um, David Berlinski. Stanislaw Ulam, the co-designer of the hydrogen bomb, and Eden himself. The conference also included a number of prominent biologists, including Ernst Meyer, an architect of modern neo-Darwinism, and Richard Lewontin, whose name you may remember, at the time a professor of genetics and evolutionary biology at the University of Chicago. Sir P Peter Medawar, a Nobel laureate and the director of the North London Medical Research Council's laboratories, chaired this meeting. In his opening remarks, he said, the immediate cause of the conference is a pretty widespread sense of dissatisfaction about what has come to be thought of as the accepted evolutionary theory in the English-speaking world, the so-called neo-Darwinian theory. Although fully aware of this range of mutational options at nature's disposal, which they just went over, mutation, transposition, um, and so forth, Eden argued that Wistar that such random changes to written text or sections of digital code would inevitably degrade the function of information bearing sequences, particularly when allowed to accumulate. For example, this simple phrase, one if by land and two if by sea, will be significantly dis degraded by just a handful of random changes, such as those in bold. If, if you can read that, good luck. Uh, Marcel Schutzenberger noted that if someone makes even a few random changes in the arrangement of the digital characters in a computer program, quote, we find that we have no chance, that is less than one in 10 to the 1,000th power, even to see what the modified program would compute. It just jams. Eden argued that much the same problem applied to DNA that insofar as specific arrangement of bases in DNA function like digital code, random changes to these arrangements would likely efface their function, while attempts to generate completely new sections of genetic text by random means were likely doomed to failure. At one level, the subject is fairly intuitive. If a thief slips around a corner of a dormitory after hours looking for a bike to steal, he will scan the bike rack for an easy target. If he spots a basic bicycle style lock with only three dials of 10 numbers each, and on the rack beside it is one with five dials of 10 numbers each, the thief won't need a degree in mathematics to realize which one he should attempt to open. He knows that he would need to search fewer t total possibilities with the three dial lock. And of course, the one dial lock would be even easier. A straightforward calculation supports his intuition. The simpler lock has only 10 times 10 times 10 or 1,000 possible combinations of digits, or what the mathematicians refer to as combinatorial possibilities. The five lock uh, dial has 100,000 poss uh, combinational possibilities. Supposing that you go through each combination in one second, well, you can see which lock you're going to have to work at harder. With a lot of patience, the thief might elect to systematically work his way through the different combinations of digits on the simpler lock, knowing that at some point he will stumble across the correct combination. He shouldn't even bother with a five dial lock, since making his way through all the possibility combinations on it would take a hundred times as long. And think about supposing you had a hundred dials. Several of the Wistar scientists noted that the mutation selection mechanism faces a similar problem. Clearly, natural selection plays a crucial role in this process. Favorable mutations are passed on, unfavorable mutations are weeded out. 
Nonetheless, the process can only select variations in the genetic text that mutations have first produced. And that was a problem, as the Wistar skeptics saw it. Random mutations must do the work of composing new genetic information, yet the sheer number of possible nucleotide bases or amino acid combinations, that is to say the size of the combinator combinatorial space, associated with a single gene or protein of even modest length, rendered the probability of random assembly prohibitively small. Just a minute here. There. Increasing the number of bases in a sequence from 1 to 2 to 3 increases the number of possibilities from 4 to 16 to 64. As the sequence length continues to grow, the number of combinatorial possibilities corresponding to sequences of increasing length inflates exponentially. For example, there are 4 to the 100th or 10 to the 60 possible ways of arranging 100 bases in a row. It's 10 to the 60 point to, which is basically 10 to the 60. The amino acid chains are also subject to such inflation. A chain of two amino acids could display 20 to the 2 power or 20 times 20 or 400 possible combinations since each of the 20 protein forming amino acids could combine with any one of the same group of 20 in the second position of a short peptide chain. With the three amino acid sequence, we're looking at 20 to the third, or 8,000. And with four, it goes up to 160,000 total combinations. And obviously, the further you go, the worse it gets. And indeed, many pr proteins typically require hundreds of amino acids in order to perform their functions. This means that an average length protein represents just one possible sequence among the, an astronomically large number, 20 to the 300, or over 10 to the 390th power of possible amino acid sequences of that length. Putting these numbers in perspective, there are only 10 to the 65 atoms in our Milky Way galaxy and 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the known universe. That is what bothered Eden and other mathematically inclined scientists at Wistar. They understood the immensity of the combinatorial spaces associated with even single genes of proteins of an average length. They realized that if the mutations themselves were truly random, that is, they were neither directed nor by an intelligence nor influenced by functional need of the organism, as neo-Darwinism stipulates, then the probability of the mutation and selection mechanism ever producing a new gene or protein could well be va vanishingly small. Eden pointed out in his Wistar presentation that the combinatorial space corresponding to an average length protein which he assumed would be 250 amino acids, is 20 to the 250, or about 10 to the 325 possible uh, amino acid arrangements. Did the mutation and selection mechanism have enough time since the beginning of the universe itself, or even beyond, to generate even a small fraction of the total number of possible amino acid sequences corresponding to a single functioning protein of that length? For Eden, the answer was clearly no. The math just won't work. Eden likened the probability of producing the human genome by relying on random mutations to that of generating a library of a thousand volumes by making random changes or additions to a single phrase in accord with the following instructions. Begin with a meaningful phrase, retype it with a few mistakes, make it longer by adding letters at random, and rearrange subsequences in the string of letters, then Examine the result to see if the new phrase is meaningful. Repeat this process until the library is complete. Well, don't think that'll work. Would such an exercise have a realistic chance of succeeding, even granting it billions of years? Eden thought not. As physicist Stanislaw Ulam explained at the conference, the evolutionary process seems to require many thousands, perhaps millions, of successive mutations to produce even the easiest complexities we see in life now. It appears, naively at least, that no matter how large the probability of a single mutation is, should it be as, even as great as one half. You would get this probability raised to a millionth power, which is so very close to zero that the chances of such a chain seem to be practically non-existent. 
In his presentation at the conference, Eden himself acknowledged a possible way of resolving this dilemma. He suggested that it was at least possible that functionally useful proteins are very common in this combinatorial space. So, in, uh, half of the combinations you come out will unlock the lock, so to speak, will produce an enzyme. So that almost any polypeptide one is likely to find as a result of mutation and selection has a useful function. Well, does it? As an, amateur, as an electrical engineer who is used to working with computer code, Eden was con intuitively disinclined to embrace this possibility. He noted that all codes and language systems can convey information precisely because they have rules of grammar and syntax. These rules ensure that not just any arrangement of characters will convey functional information. For this reason, functioning sequences and working communication systems are typically surrounded in the larger combinatorial space by a multitude of non-functional sequences, sequences that don't obey the rules. Yet in 1966, none of the scientists on either side of the debates at Wistar knew how rare or common functioning gene, functional genes and amino acid sequences are among the corresponding space of total possibilities? Do they occur with the frequency of one in 10, one in a million, one in a million, billion, trillion, smaller? At the time, these questions could not be answered. But as we will see, they have been in progressively better approximations in search of the ratio. Denton's prediction um, of the imminent progress, that is to say, this is the problem we need to solve and we're going to solve it, proved correct. During the late 1980s and early 1990s, Robert Sauer, a molecular biologist at MIT, performed a series of experiments that first attempted to measure the rarity of proteins within amino acid sequence space. And briefly, um, molecular, molecular biologists uh, had developed technologies for making customized synthetic DNA molecules, and Sauer used these techniques to make site-directed changes to DNA sequences of specific genes of known function, and then to insert those variations into bacterial cells. And then he could see, evaluate the effects of those various targeted alterations to a DNA sequence of the function of their protein product products within a bacterial cell. In other words, you could see whether it worked or not and how well. Based on one set of mutagenesis experiments, Sauer and his colleagues estimated the ratio of functional to non-functional amino acid sequences at about 1 in 10 to the 63 for a short protein of 92 amino acids in length. Now remember that's not 1 to the 20 to the 63. If you were to com compare apples with apples, that means that over half of the amino acids have to be accurate. Exactly, and then the rest don't matter. Now, it's not really that way. You know. There's some that can tolerate three different amino acids here, but if you do any of the other 20, it, it won't work, and so forth. But the math comes out to that approximation. This result was in rough agreement with an earlier estimate by uh, information theorist Hubert Yaki. Yaki used already published data co to compare variants of the similar cytochrome C proteins in different species. Basically, he did kind of a natural experiment. Well, what's the sequence here? What's the sequence here? If you compare them, how much variation can you allow? He determined the ratio of functional to non-functional sequences to be about 1 in 10 to the 90 for amino acid chains of the length of cytochrome C. So we're coming out with numbers that are fairly close to each other. Sauer showed that for every functional 92 amino acid sequence, there are roughly another 10 to the 63 non-functional sequences of the same length. To put that ratio in perspective, the probability of attaining a correct sequence by random search would be roughly equal to the probability of a blind spaceman finding a single marked atom, by chance, among all the atoms in the Milky Way galaxy. Which star do you start searching on? Clearly not a likely outcome. Yet at least one scientist 
Lee, High University biochemist Michael Behe, cited Sauer's qualita quantitative estimate of the rarity of proteins as the decisive refutation of the creative power of the mutation and selection mechanism. Some people disregarded this. Behe took it and ran with it. So by the mid-1990s, though Sauer and his group had initiated a program of experimental research that addressed the key question that Murray Eden raised at Wistar, that question has not, still not been completely settled. Did the mutation and natural selection mechanism have a realistic chance of finding the new genes and protein necessary to build, for example, a new Cambrian animal? Answering that would have to wait an even more systematic and comprehensive experimental regime. Um, now, actually, the next chapter is about Douglas Axe and his experiments, which are a refinement of the experiments of Sauer. And uh, I'll spoil the plot by telling you that Douglas Axe came up with roughly the same numbers as Sauer, even though there were several possible sources of error in Sauer's uh, approximation. Uh, when you actually go to measure them, they cancel each other out. I think the problem of information is getting better defined. I think there is not a Darwinian solution. I think that other solutions, such as uh, James Shapiro's way of saying maybe life designs itself, uh, either requires a more complex or more specified, or both, starting point. In other words, now you have to have genes that will tell the organism how and when to mutate. So uh, the, the program gets more complicated for the initial organism. And I think this is the strongest argument against naturalistic evolution that we have. And I think it's really no wonder that its advocates avoid the subject, which is actually going to come out in the next um, section that we deal with. Um, it's a good thing I had fewer slides than last week. Otherwise, we would be over time already. Um, but it is now your turn. We have about five minutes to go before uh, 1130. Yes. I think the <coughs> strongest arguments to argue, argument against naturalistic evolution is the impossibility of generating life in, in vitro. That <coughs> I think the whole enterprise should shut down until they can show how to produce a living form in c from scratch. Okay, so well, uh, the, this is an there's, exercise. There's something important though, and that is that if you, if you allow <coughs> for uh, a miracle at the beginning of life, an intelligent agent that goes in and changes things, then you're gonna have to allow for a miracle either at the beginning of life, planning for the Cambrian explosion and somehow not tipping it off until a billion years later, by which time you would think mm -hmm. that the DNA would degrade, or else you have to have somebody is specifically uh, intervening there, or else maybe there hasn't been that much time. Uh, Those are kind of the choices you've got. Uh, the, the second point I want to make is, <clears throat> if you have a chain of amino acids <clears throat> of any sequence, in, then, and let's assume that the amino acid sequence is accurate, that is, will produce a functional protein. In order for the protein to function, you have to fold that uh, linear change into chain into a specified shape. And because each amino acid or each combination of amino acid can assume different configurations, <clears throat> in the absence of any uh, biological process, the, um, the time it takes for a chain of 100 amino acid to fold becomes a very, very long time. I'm talking years. In living cells, there is a second structure called the proteasome. And we have, a, we have a bacterium that has to, has to split and use that thing within 20 minutes. The, exactly. So there is a, a very miraculous, that we still don't understand how it happens, that the chain goes into the proteasome. 
and comes out functional within milliseconds. But of course, when, when you do calculations, you don't do that. Uh, you're, so, you're talking about things like chaperone proteins? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. the chaperone proteins. With the expenditure of energy, ATP. So the folding does not happen instantaneously. It's a very, very long process because of the number of possible f f uh, ways that a protein can fold. <clears throat> so all these complications are, of course, totally ignored in, in a calculation of this kind because this is done by mathematicians who have not a clue how bio biology works. <clears throat> Uh, Ariel, and then uh, we got one over here. Well, I, I just in comment to, to uh, George's uh, last comment here about the mathematicians don't know how biology works. Uh, this was just the ar very argument that uh, the biologists at the Wistar Institute then used against uh, Eden and the others. Uh, uh, to say, well, uh, okay, they can they can play with their mathematics. They don't know biology. We know biology, and we know that evolution took place, and so on. Uh, saying they don't know the biology, uh, it turns out that uh, if they'd known the biology, it has now it'd been much worse than they presented it. Yeah. That, that you have not only the problem of the protein itself, but the protein that makes the protein fold the way it's supposed to? And is there, it sounds like there's not just a chaperone protein, but there's a whole horde of them inside of a proteasome that, uh, that, um, that you have. It has to be right there. Sitting, okay. waiting for the. Waiting for the chain to be delivered from by the ribosome. It, it's a very, very complex mechanism. But, uh, but you also have to have a regulator to tell when it turns on and when it turns off so you don't have a flood of it, flooding the cell and destroying exactly. the cell. Exactly. Uh, you should. Let's see, we have a comment. Yes, I think you've uh, presented not only today, but on, in the series of lectures that you've had on this particular book. Uh, a very effective refutation of what you just uh, called naturalistic evolution. But uh, the idea that evolution is uh, a result of uh, some causal mechanism that we call natural selection working on random events, chance events that we call mutations this particular conception of evolution as it existed in Darwin or as it was refined uh, by Simpson and the population geneticists and the neo-Darwins and so on down to present day uh, biology uh, dealing That's with what's the, taught in high school biology the DNA. I think we have to recognize that there, if you'll pardon my use of the term, been an evolution of both evolutionary thinking on the one hand, and secondly, of theological thinking on the other hand, yes. uh, uh, from the time when these were seen as two irreconcilable alternatives. And we have to face the fact that there are a very great many people of faith who believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. They do it by having a very different conception of evolution in the first place and also by having a very different conception of intelligent design. Mm -hmm. That is basically what they say is that uh, they believe that all you need is a telescope and a microscope to find out that evolution is going on. You know, stars are constantly being born, they're dying, galaxies are being created, you can observe this. Creation wasn't something that happened way back there at one time and everything has stood still since. It's an ongoing process. And in the same, uh, by the same token, uh, recent developments in theology, uh, particularly under the influence of philosophers like Hegel and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, have generated what's called today process theology, uh, 
which is really just another name for saying that God works through evolution mm -hmm. and that creation is essentially an evolutionary process. And if we're going to make this seminar on faith and science complete, I think we also need to examine this intermediate position if for no other reason than to refute it if you want to do that uh, in the same way that you're refuting Darwinian evolution or if you happen as actually the majority of people of faith in the world do today, believe that that's a tenable position that you can reconcile the two, then uh, yeah. you could show that. But I think this alternative needs to be examined. I, I think you're exactly right. And I think that one of the things I'd like to do is after we have finished the book and we have discussed the argument to design, then I think we need to complete it by discussing the argument from design. Once we accept that uh, there is such a thing as design, where do we go from there? Uh, and uh, that's something that design theorists usually don't want to talk about because I think we get fairly rapidly tangled up into theology, you know, is there a God? And of course, one of the things that you'll find out, if you have an absolute knockdown argument against uh, naturalistic, mechanistic, whatever you want to call it, evolution, uh, Darwinian, um, the next thing, the, the, the big criticism you'll get is, well, uh, embodied designers we can handle, disembodied designers we can't. And I know there are kind of quasi-political reasons for not discussing that, and I can understand not doing that at the beginning because you want to keep that discussion within science. But I think that at some point it has to leave science in order to say, you know, we're talking about God. And then where do we go from there? What kind of a God are we talking about? Uh, and, and, uh, and so what I'd like to do afterwards is address this very question. Once you've accepted design, where do you go from there? Uh, just as a footnote, I'd like to add kind that when I uh, was an undergraduate student studying philosophy 70 years ago, uh, we used to hear that there were four arguments for the existence of God the argument from causation, the argument from contingency, the argument from design, and uh, Ansel's argument, ontological argument. Well, that was pretty well the last one shot down by Immanuel Kant, so that there were really just three. And it was held then that the argument from design was the weakest argument, that causality and causation, particularly among Catholics and Neo-Thomists, was regarded as the strongest argument. But I think actually the argument for design is the strongest one for the existence of God. And the interesting thing is that I believe the majority of biologists writing now and studying and experimenting are arguing that there's something is going on in nature that's very similar to what we call intelligence and purpose in ourselves. Uh, that as the 90th Psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth show us his handiwork. Well, I, I agree with you. And in fact, uh, there's somebody else who agrees with you that probably more authoritative in that regard than me. And that is Anthony Flew before he died. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, what disturbs me is the thought control that's going on. I don't think if they can help it, they'll allow an intelligent discussion or alternatives to come forward. I just got an email from the Discovery, and so they're at crying for help because they're being attacked so viciously. And I guess they wanted a contribution to help them in some way. But that, that is frightening, a thought control. Um, and unfortunately, there are some documentation, uh, documented uh, evidences of that. And one of my more successful presentations turned out to be the one on uh, the missing presentation where uh, the guys just, they, they made their presentation, it was clearly made, it just disappeared from the program. Mm 
without a word. And when they ask what happened, well, you know, we exercise our prerogative. We don't think it's scientific, and it's not going back. I'm talking about carbon-14. So there, there are two places. I, I think that there are people who feel that science must be safe for atheists. And if ever there are conclusions that are not comfortable for atheists, then they just need to be ignored. No, I agree. And well, not suppressed. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, you do it the best way you can. Although, as we talked about earlier, the people who tried to shoot ID people ended up shooting themselves in the foot. Um, and the presentation is entitled, Don't Mess With ID. Uh, if you get a chance to look at that, if you haven't, <laughs> it's just amazing. Well, actually, it, he was wrong. It isn't hundreds of millions of years. It's only 160 million years that you'd expect a new uh, two mutation event in humans. Um, uh, it was mentioned that new stars and planets are being formed, or are they being discovered? The new what? New stars are being formed, and new planets are coming. Stars new and stars? planets are being discovered. Are they being uh -huh. formed? Are they coming into existence now? Most people would say that they are just being discovered because the the standard model for formation of stars and planets is that you don't see the, the change is so slow that you don't actually see it. So if we see a new planet, it must have been there for the entire history of, of a civilized man. Now, there are some interesting exceptions to that um, in that the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, used to be described by all the literature as red. It is now blue. And um, exactly how that happened, um, was there a gas giant that suddenly collapsed? Um, there, Sirius is actually a double star, and the biggest star is blue, and there's a smaller white dwarf right next to it. We don't know how that works. In fact, uh, the Precambrian uh, single cell with the flagellum that you mentioned in the beginning happens to be the most perfect outboard motor ever made. And it's, well, it's certainly, uh, compared with human motors, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, we have one more question, and then I'm going to try to see if we can wrap it up. On uh, CNN this week, one of the news points was that they have discovered the largest and most distant galaxy ever. And within that galaxy is a humongous formation of new stars. Yeah, but nobody's watching them from year to year and, and seeing them light up. They, from, from our scale, they haven't changed. Sirius is the one exception that I can give you that has changed in historic times. Well, that's, that's true. Yeah, supernovas blow up and then disappear. And, uh, and those change over dramatically over the over the course of a couple of uh, weeks, in fact. Um, but they're, they're usually considered to be a special case. And within the history, recent history of astronomy, there are many instances, of course, of observed stars turning into novas, which is part of the death of the star. Yeah, in fact, the one of the ways of, da of dating a galaxy, or, or, of, of, of measuring the brightness of a galaxy, is to see how bright the supernovas are in it. Uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting way of, uh, it suggests that all, in, in any galaxy at any given time, there's one or two supernovas going off. But no, no new ones are forming. Well, we do see new ones. Uh, there, are, there are supernovas, the Crab Nebula in particular, that we can date with fair accuracy exactly when it exploded because one day people look up in the sky and they saw a new star, which is what nova means. It's new. And Stephen Hawking has reconsidered his original
thinking on black, on black holes. So that's an exciting uh, new adventure that we can explore, which we have been doing that for many years now. Uh, it will be interesting to see what happens. Anyway, come back next Sabbath and we'll discuss the final uh, denouement of, uh, of the question of how much, how common are enzymes in the space of all polypeptides and, uh, and then draw some conclusions from it.